In this video, I'm going to be talking about the monophonic orchestral texture from George Frederick McKay's book, Creative Orchestration. If you haven't yet seen the video where I introduce the concept of the eight orchestral textures from his book, I suggest you go check that out. I'm doing a separate video for each of the textures, so this one will focus on the monophonic, and to make sure you catch the other ones when those are ready, please remember to subscribe. So the monophonic texture is one sound, one line. It could mean just a soloist playing a melody, or it could mean two people in unison or in octaves, or it could mean your entire orchestra in unison and octaves. So you can go from a very isolated, uh, intimate, single sound to just a massive, huge sound, all from a single melody. So I think it's a bit underrated how much mileage you can actually get with a single melody, either in unison or in octaves, and how much focus and intensity and interest you can get when you're contrasting a complex texture with then a single focused line, it can add a really interesting different section to your piece. And a lot of pieces will actually start with the monophonic texture at the beginning. Uh, there's a certain kind of like opening the curtain idea of like here, let's just focus on this one line before we expand out into richer harmonic colors. So one of the most famous examples of the monophonic texture in an orchestral setting comes from Scheherazade uh, by Rimsky-Korsakov. The very opening of the piece starts on this huge uh, octave and unison line, which is just full of power. If I remember correctly, I think it's meant to represent the emperor and it's very domineering and powerful and majestic and big. Like I said in the beginning, you can really get a lot of power out of one pitch, surprisingly. I think a lot of people think you need complexity to get power, but really simplicity can give it to you as well. So there's a couple of things that he's doing here that are interesting besides just straight up doubling things in octaves. If we notice right at the beginning here, the horns and trumpets only speak on that first note and then they rest for the rest of the time. So there's this subtle oomph and push of emphasis on beat one on the introduction. Those beginning and ending points are really great opportunities to use kind of subtle moments to just push distinction and help us feel the form and help us feel uh, the significance of beginning and ending your phrases. So he does that here by giving these instruments a chance to speak on that first note so you really feel it and then they stay out of the way. The next thing I want to point out is that the top main line has this trill, but on the much lower instruments on the trombones and on the contrabass, he skips that trill because that would just be kind of thick and muddy and um, not really a nice, clear, balanced sound. Speaking of balance, his main line is on this E here. That's his top point. And he's got 12 voices, 12 instruments on that line. The next octave down, he has six voices. He's got the bassoon, two of the horns, trombones, the cello. Then that final octave on the bottom, he just has that low trombone and the contrabass. So there's a bit of a, a balance from the me medium, then half as many for the lower octave, and then even less than half as many for the very bottom. He's able to get a balance that way. So those low instruments really do fill up a lot of space. Uh, if he was just literally doubling the same amount of instruments at each range, I think you would get too bottom heavy and thick and muddy a sound. The violins skip out this last note and I don't think that's for any sort of balanced textural intention other than the line is just out of the range of the violins. Uh, you can hear it slightly when I play this back in Sibelius, but when you listen to a real recording, I can't really tell the difference. You can't really tell that the violins have stopped there. It's pretty subtle. What is less subtle is that the violins and all of the brass are completely out on this echo of that final statement. So. You can see it's marked mezzo forte as opposed to the fortissimo we started with. And instead of just telling all your players, okay, I want you to be quieter, he's intentionally writing that into the orchestration. So he's using his orchestration to achieve what he needs to musically say. What he's trying to say is I want this to be quieter. So again, not just telling everybody to play quieter, but also using less instruments. It seems obvious, but you'd be surprised how often sometimes people can overlook the idea that if you want something to be quieter, you just have less people play it. So let's take a listen to this. Again, focus on just how big and powerful it sounds, and also some of those little subtle moments where things are emphasized at the very beginning and then de-emphasized at the very end of it.
So now I want to actually apply the monophonic texture to some real orchestration. So I'm going to take the Breath of the Wild theme here, just an eight bar melody with chords, and see what we can do with it with the monophonic texture to get some interest and some maybe some color contrast and still make it an interesting melody to listen to even though we're only using octaves and unisons. So I think I am gonna make a point of kind of exaggerating some of the contrast you can do here. So don't take this as a literal idea of how to do this for a single phrase. It might be a little schizophrenic, but I do wanna kind of push some of the moments of extreme loudness and extreme quietness just to make the point. So before I even open up the orchestral page, I wanna look at this and see if I can make a plan. So I'm thinking, this is what the melody sounds like. So that's what I'm working with. What I'm thinking I will do is really push like the Scheherazade, really push this huge, really big opening, and then counter that with a sudden drop down to very quiet. Maybe we can swell back up and get huge again, and then do the same thing, and we'll get super quiet for that last phrase. So what that means here is I'm gonna want this guy to be in multiple octaves. Uh, I, won't, I won't write them all in, I'll do just that much at least to make the point. And maybe this one we're gonna make way up there. And I can even put some notes to myself. So orchestral 2D, meaning everybody, which will be the same down here. This guy, I'm thinking just the piccolo. Maybe this guy can be the violins. And then on these notes, we will reintroduce some of our guys. So um, maybe the low, lower strings and horns can come back in on that. So you can see I've got a plan here without having to look at the complexity of a full orchestral score and just kind of the overwhelmingness that might come from that. I'm just on this single line looking at it like, okay, what, what am I gonna do here? And then this is gonna become in a lot of ways an exercise of just transferring the parts to the orchestral score now. Instead of opening up a template, which I might usually do in Sibelius, I'm gonna add the instruments as I think of them. Uh, I think that might make it a little more clear what I'm doing and also, let's, let's just do a traditional wind section up here. Let's plot those guys out first. So of course now I don't want the... That's our main line and that will fit well. Get rid of our chords. That will fit well on these ranges. It can be... Uh, let's go here and let's think if we're gonna do two flutes, two oboes, two clarinets, two bassoons, as is traditional, then we could do each single one of those as an octave and we'll put you on that higher octave. I'm actually gonna add a piccolo and put that one on the piccolo there for our second flute. And I think with the violins, I will copy that line on just the flute. And then when we come over here, let's look at it this way. We're gonna put that guy on just that piccolo. This guy is gonna get on him again.
And we'll do the same thing with the oboes. Clarinet. Bassoon. So this is telling me that note's out of range. It's in the range of the oboe. It's just really squawky. I don't really care how squawky it's going to be because this is going to be massive, big sound. So I'm not really that worried about it. I'm going to even just say, don't bug me about that right now. That's really not the point. This is being performed by Sibelius. I'm not shipping this off to a real orchestra. But again, that squawkiness is really going to not stick out in the grand scheme of this massive orchestral tuning. So I already have my winds laid out. It should be pretty easy for me. Let's see if I want to add um, maybe just, just this guy coming back in to start building up our sound. Uh, we'll, we'll do that on the oboes too. Start building back into it. Now let's add some brass. Uh, again, we'll keep it pretty traditional. We'll do four horns on two staves, trumpet, trombone, and tuba. Let's grab this for our trumpets. I think we'll do our horns. Uh, an octave lower. I'll just look at a transposing score sometimes. Do an octave lower. I'm going to let these guys build in with that crescendo. Trombones are going to match pretty nicely with my bassoons. And then here, I'll leave that top note because we'll just do that. You know what I think I'll do is actually to kind of copy that uh, Scheherazade idea. How about on Let's see who could do it. Um, actually, maybe on the horns. Let's do that. Let's have just the horns. Play that first note and the tuba. Same thing here. We'll also note that I want some phrasing here. All right, now let's add uh, a timpani to copy that. How would you not be? Let's add a timpani, not two timpanis, just one would be fine, thank you. Timpani. And we'll have him just copy what the tuba is doing. And now let's add our strings. And actually, I'm going to add harp as well. So let's add harp, strings, grab our flute as our model here. Bases will have just copy our low guys. Actually, I don't want these, do I? Just thinking I'll have the harp maybe play along with this last little phrase. Maybe an octave lower. All right. So let's ditch our original. And there it is. Let's see what we got. All right, that's a good start. Uh, a couple things I noticed is 
It would actually be cool if that oomph that we're doing on beat one, I think could do the whole first three notes, I think would be nice. So instead of just the clonk, we do the whole, I think would be good. So. the octaves. Yeah, I like that. And then I want everybody to duck down. Hmm, I'm gonna leave the bassoon, even though he's kind of the only guy in that low end there. I think we need the lower octave, perhaps, on these guys. Well, well, let's hear, I wanna hear that again. Maybe we could sneak into that a little bit. So it was a D flat chord. Oh uh, yeah, I don't wanna violate the idea of uh, the monophonic texture by bringing in anybody who's not part of it. But what if just he came in? That could be interesting. But those guys. Let's see. So now the only other tweak I would make is have those guys also be doing the uh, diminuendo. All right, so there we go. Pretty good for a quick run through of how the monophonic texture can be applied to an existing melody. You can see that there's a lot of contrast. There's sections that are loud and intense and sections that are lighter. And we can even build in some crescendos and some builds in other moments. Um, and really have kind of what on the surface is kind of a straight ahead melody, all of a sudden we're adding bits of intensity and violence versus lightness and softness at the very end. So to play that through one more time. And again, the point of the monophonic texture is unisons and uh, octaves. So there are no other chord tones. There's no harmony happening here at any time. So the next texture after the monophonic is the chordal texture. And that's where we kind of twist the monophonic into 3D or into Technicolor by adding chord tones and uh, harmonic richness to it. So please subscribe so you catch when that one comes out and I'll see you there. Mm -hmm.